Good afternoon and welcome to the Centre for Computing History. Or, yeah, morning, mid-evening, night time, whenever. Yeah, well, anyway, today we're looking at a tattooing machine. Um, most people know them for the Einstein computer. A few people might know them for their terminals. We're looking at something a little bit more unusual. Uh, this is a terminal and a computer. It's the Tatung TPC2000. If we uh, zoom in on the name tag there. And it's a lovely looking machine. It's got obviously detachable keyboard, very nice, ergonomic. Keyboard plugs in the front of the computer, which is you know, not guaranteed. Um, little monochrome monitor here, but you can swivel it up and down and around. So, you know, ergonomic. You say it looks a bit industrial where the monitor fits onto the top of the unit. It is, and it's, it's one of these ones where it's um, sort of attached into a little impression on the top of the case. Clearly it was made for it, but it's a nice little, nice little system. So in the 80s, uh, if your company had a computer, it was probably a mini computer or a small mainframe with terminals connected on into people's individual desks. And this is a terminal. When you turn it on, it's got a serial port in the back and whatever you type goes straight away to the other end of the network connection and the data that comes back is displayed on the screen. Very basic, very dumb. It is, however, also a computer in its own right. Uh, when you turn it on, switch it into local mode and hit the F1 key and it will boot from disk. And at that point, it's a fully fledged computer running the CPM operating system. So 64K of RAM, it runs a Z80 processor and it loads in little command process, uh, command prompt, sorry. 64K for a PC type machine doesn't sound an awful lot. It doesn't if you assume by PC an IBM compatible computer. But for a CPM machine, obviously they run an 8-bit processor. 64K is generally the maximum amount of addressable space. So this is not, not an under machine, I don't think. Should we fire it up? Yeah. We do whilst have, whilst we we're do doing that. that, I can say that you, you could buy it in one of two models. So one that had five, one 5 and a quarter inch disc or two 5 and a quarter inch discs. And... It also has a connector on the back to connect 8-inch drives. 8-inch discs, of course, being physically much larger, but you could store more on. They were more popular at the time. So, blinky cursor, that it's it in comes. terminal mode. But if we hit F1, disc light comes on and it will load the CPM system. And is there no better noise in the world than that? The manual actually describes the disc noises as whirring and clacking, which is a lovely phrase. So you see, it seems to think that we've got four disk drives. That's actually because uh, each side of the floppy disk is a separate disk to the software. It's a bit of an odd setup. Uh, it also mentions it's got a Centronic list type. This would be your printer used for quite literally listing data out. And the serial port is set at 9600 board, and that's controlled by some dip switches on the back, which we'll show you or cut away to later. Oh, typo. And yeah, there's the contents of our disk. It's a fairly standard looking CPM setup. Uh, com files are executable. It's got a copy of WordStar on there, which is not configured to work with any particular printer, so you can't use it yet. It's got a text editor and assembler, and a couple of test programs. So CR test uh, is a test of the video system. Now, one interesting thing about this otherwise rather boring test program is that because it prints out all the characters the system supports, you can see that it got a pound symbol. This is the British variant. I'm guessing if they sold them in other countries, that would be localized and you'd have a different character ROM for each one. That's quite nice. You can also see that it supports bold or intense video, reverse video, blinking and underlining in hardware, which is quite a nice feature if you're doing word processing. Hit escape, it will reload the command prompt. Directory. It is. I've not really used CPM systems much. It's vaguely similar to MS-DOS, with DOS version 1, of course, being uh, a licensed or rather bought-out copy of QDOS, which was in, in turn a clone of CPM. So you can see the similarities. So for the complete computer newbie out there, what does CPM stand for? Control Program, and the M is variously microprocessor or microcomputer, depending on who you ask. I think typically it has a slash in it. In fact, if 
I don't know if we can get a close up of this. This is the original system disk, which we're not using. We're using a copy. I have to keep this one safe. This is CPM version 2.2. It, strangely, it also says version 4.0 below it, which is presumably a Tatung version number. Uh, CPM was generally customized for every computer it ran on. So you'd have to swap out the routines that wrote and read character uh, data and control the I.O. ports. But yeah, a lovely little machine. I see we feel that we have basic. Oh, we do. Let's see what we can do in basic. So what we've got here, we've got uh, it's Microsoft Basic. Microsoft, of course, they got their start uh, providing programming languages rather than operating systems. And almost every 8-bit microcomputer back in the day used a licensed version of Microsoft Basic. Notable exceptions, of course, being the BBC Micro and I think Commodore, who initially used it and then stripped all the Microsoft logos off. Sinclair. Of course, Sinclair. They, they had a terrible keyboard, so they had to have their own basics to avoid having to type so much. So what do you do with basic? You do print hello world. The classic first program. 20 go to 10. Perfect. I am a programmer now. I don't know how you stop it running. Uh, is it break? Is it not break? Not escape? We might be stuck here now. That could be a good time then reset. to it was reset. take a look inside the machine. Yeah, let's get some close-ups of the hardware, see what's making this thing tick. Um, before we turn it off, of course, make sure to take the disk out. The manual does call that out. If you have the disk in the drive where power is being applied or removed, there's a chance it will wipe whatever's under the read-write head. So, you know, do watch out for that. Something about magnetic fields. It uses the phrase anomalous magnetic field, which is, the manual has some very odd phrasings in it. In fact, we've got a small print out here of Appendix G failure checklist, which starts off with symptom one, nothing works, check mechanical collections, and then all the way down at number six, grossly anomalous behavior, another wonderful set of words. Uh, it leads off with suspect operator error, try again, which is, you know, generally what, what the problem is. You're using it wrong. Style-wise, I think it's a pretty nice looking machine. I like the greys and the beige. It breaks up the uh, monotony of the colours somewhat. Nice thing about the grey plastic, of course, it very rarely yellows. Um, but yeah, now looking at the keyboard, it's nicely laid out. It's got proper key switches, not clicky, but nice enough. Because it's a terminal, of course, it's got return and line feed keys and 16 function keys. And they're all reprogrammable. The CPM disk has a utility that lets you program those to send any sequence of keystrokes off to whatever remote system you're talking to, which is quite nice. We did notice one thing with it, though. It's obviously meant to have the keyboard slide nicely under the case. Yeah, it's got this little shelf cut out here. And you can see it, it almost works, except somebody's put the keyboard cable in the wrong place, so it doesn't quite fit, which is a shame. But that's a nice feature, because obviously in the early 80s, you didn't have computers at every desk. Your desk was used for papers for working, so your you weren't on your computer all the time. So it's good that you can just push it out the way to use your desk as a desk for doing real work, not playing around on the computer. Yeah, it's... It also has an illuminated power switch, which I really like. You know, little light-up switches, they please me. Okay, Phil, so we have opened her up. We have. Uh, it splits down the middle, top just lifts off, and in the top of the case, we've got the power supply and a fan attached to it. By Aztec, I believe, a very widely used power supply. Yeah, you find them in everything. BBC Micros, they were very popular. Also, um, made modulators for the 8 bits as well. Ah. Um, the power supply, you might notice, has a popped capacitor down there. They do tend to go, and that will need replacing at some point. Uh, also got the floppy drives. They're not actually in the lid. They're supposed to attach on here with this metal plate. Uh, we should put them over there so we can see what's in the bottom half of the case. They're standard floppy drives, TX, I think. So, onto the, uh, the main board, as it were, all the way over here. It's fairly spacious. Um, Z80 processor, of course, hiding all the way over here, uh, next to this little bodge job. Someone's stuck a couple of resistors and a transistor vertically, maybe to fix up some to do with the clock, I don't know. We haven't got schematics for this, so we're sort of, not guessing, but making reasonable assumptions. 
A uh, little buzzer attached here. It can do beeps. They're quite high pitched and shrill. Not very pleasant at all. Um, all these chips down here say Z80, but they're not processors. They are support chips. So there's a PIO, is a parallel IO interface. DART, I think, contains two serial interfaces. And CTC is counter timer chip or something along those lines. Um, but those together form the heart of the computer, really. Uh, this set of chips along here is your RAM, dynamic RAM, so that needs, needs refreshing constantly. Uh, these two ones here are SRAM, and that's for the video display, so it stores the contents of the video. Character generator is, and uh, video generator, sorry, it's going to be this one here, so that's an SY6545. And you've got two EEPROMs. So this one here has, says CHTUK, that's going to be holding the font for the video chip. And the one over there is the boot loader. Normally all this will be covered by the floppy drives, that's why we've taken them off. Uh, the floppy drives connect uh, to this connector over here, and the green connector just behind it is for connecting external 8-inch floppy drives. Uh, the other green connector on the other end is just marked expansion. Uh, presumably there was another box you could get that plugged into this, and the manual does mention that you can get uh, a GPIO card that slots in, there's some RAM card that slots in, but they're not for usable memory. It's described as a virtual disk, which I think is some sort of RAM disk system. Up to 256k. That's a reasonable size for a RAM disk. Probably quite expensive given RAM prices in the 80s. Uh, the keyboard connects down here and goes off to the front of the case, which is a nice touch, rather than having the cable snake externally all the way around the back. Uh, DIN connector for the monitor. It takes its power from there as well, which is always nice, saving the cable. Uh, serial and parallel outputs and inputs there, and some dip switches, which, according to the manual, are really just for configuring the serial interface for when you want to use it at the terminal. So you don't have to do any sort of software setup, you turn it on and it's ready to go. And yeah, looking, looking at it, you can see, as well as the big bulge over here, there's a couple of other modifications. So we've got the capacitor jammed on here, um, there's another one I saw just over here. Uh, clearly this is an early, earlier revision of the board before they had all those bugs sorted out. People to fix it in the factory with a little bit of handwork. Yeah, nice little board. Yeah. Right, so that's our little look at the Tatung TPC 2000. Uh, quite an uncommon little machine, like we said. If you'd like to help us out, then uh, do subscribe to our Patreon and help us make more of these videos. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. That was the world today. I have no idea. Now let's hit it with a screwdriver. I froze there for a minute.